and welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary stranger, hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Christiana Rickard, the niece of Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz, is with us in Hour One. And uh, Dr. Lynn Kitai, the foremost authority on the Phoenix Lights mass UFO sighting in Hour Two. Hard to believe that's been over 21 years. March of 97. Let me introduce the boys in the band. It's been several weeks since we've all been assembled under one roof. We've been in kind of summer mode, madly off in all directions. On the flying V Gibson guitar, on the other side of the glass, technical producer Ian Robertson. And then on this side of the glass... On the Rickenbacker bass guitar and occasionally the theremin, my story producer, Albert Vinzel. Albert, welcome. And finally, but uh, least but not last, or last but not least, rather, on the Hammond B3, our live stream producer, Ryan White. Gentlemen, uh, thank you all. Uh, the program would not be possible without you. All right, back in May, Jerry Marin. Who was Jerry Marin, you ask? Well, he was the last surviving munchkin from the Wizard of Oz. He died at 98 due to complications from congestive heart failure, according to his family. Marin died in his sleep on May the 24th at a private home care residence in La Jolla, California, where he had been in hospice care for six months. He stood four foot three and acted in over 100 movies and TV shows over the past 70 years. But he's perhaps best remembered, of course, for his role in the 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz. Hard to believe that that movie was made almost 80 years ago. Uh, and for many of us, of course, Dorothy, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and of course, the Scarecrow, remain among the most enduring characters in both literature and film. And we're going to take a peek behind the scenes of the great movie, A True American Fairy Tale, with the niece of the Scarecrow, Ray Bolger, uh, of course. Christiana Rickard grew up in Los Angeles in a large family of artistic people, which included, of course, her very famous uncle. Uh, Chris was close to her family and helped care for them in their final days. Her memories inspired her book, A Legend in Straw, which reveals the secrets she learned from her uncle. She now lives in Texas, where she's working with other women to develop new styles of leadership for a challenging world. She's attended numerous Oz events around the, the uh, country uh, with her friend Vincent Morand, who painted the portrait of the cover of her book. And Chris uh, has a, a B.A. in theater. She holds an ecumenical spiritual director's certificate. She's an animal lover with five dogs and one beautiful cat, all uh, cohabiting peacefully under one roof. Uh, Christiana Rickard, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? Hi, Richard. Thank you so much. Listen, that music that you opened with was uh, pretty incredible. And uh, my first thought was my Uncle Ray would have loved this, and it reminded me a bit of the jitterbug number that was removed from the movie. Oh, there was a jitterbug m- a number that was removed? I oh, yeah, there was a, a, a song called The Jitterbug, which was a quite a big, long num- dance number. Um and it, that was cut from the movie, yeah. As as well as something else that was cut was that, you know, my, my Uncle Ray's, um, you know, if I only had a brain number, was cut way down, too, in terms of the length of the dance. Oh. Now, yeah. how did how did he how did he land that role? He was originally supposed to be the Tin Man, wasn't he? He was supposed to be the Tin Man, and, you know, he, he never, he, he, he loved the Scarecrow all of his life. And always wanted to play the Scarecrow and was very inspired by Fred Stone, who played the Scarecrow on, on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And he had seen that. And uh, so he, you know, he fought for the part. He just said he wanted, you know, he was just meant to play the Scarecrow. So um, he just, with my, along with my aunt, you know, they just worked hard to get him the part. And Buddy Epson was nice enough to step aside and let him take the part. Now, and, Buddy uh, Epson wasn't out well. <laughs> Buddy Epson also wasn't he also supposed to play the Tin Man originally, but he had an allergic reaction to the paint. Yes, well, that, that's because he was originally to play the Scarecrow, and so when my uncle Ray stepped into the Scarecrow role, he took on the Tin Man role and got very sick and had to drop out. And that's when Jack Haley took 
right. the role of the, of the Tin Man. Ah, amazing. So Yeah, so Buddy Edson was out of the picture and quite ill, and then Jack Haley had um, a bit of a struggle with the makeup also, but, um, you know, nothing nothing too serious. And and how, what was it like? I mean, you, you must have just, I can't imagine how wonderful it would have been to sit around and talk to your Uncle Ray, uh, and and um, he, he was married, was it your mother's, or your father's sister? He married your yes, father's sister. Yes, that's right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's... Was he just as, as as kind and lovable in real life as he was on the screen? He was. He was. And uh, tonight, uh, just just before the show, I uh, just for the fun of it, I Googled him. And, do you know, every time I do this, the number of pictures and things from his life and career... It, it just doubles and triples. So my heart is just so full tonight looking over all these, so many of them from his career, from early days, from things I've never, ever seen before. And so, you know, this is one of the joys of of the Internet is that people can just uh, see so much more and, uh, you know, of, of what his career was, was all about and who he was. Yeah, he was so well loved, and um, you know he's just a, he's just a part of everybody's life. I think. Right. Oh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's course, everyone's yeah. uncle. He's everyone's uncle. Yeah, that's basically true. And um, when I when I wrote the little book, it's kind of a memoir. You know, it's, it's not a it's not a full biography of my uncle, but it's my my life with my uncle and the things that he taught me and. Um, you know, and I and I know that I know how people feel about the scarecrow. You know, like I just know because I know what he meant to us. And um, you know, there was just something so touching about him, and he had that big heart. And his whole career, basically, you know, what he said. I mean, from early days in vaudeville, he just he wanted to make people happy. You know. Yes. Yes. And that was what he thought his job in life was. So he was. Uh, Did he ever play a villain in the movies? Uh, yes, well, he did actually. You know, he played a villain, not a very serious villain, but he played Barnaby in Babes in Toyland. Ah, uh, yes. Which was a Walt Disney picture. It was kind of a, you know, a Disney style sure. villain. I can't, but he did. Yeah. I can't imagine, and, um, I can't imagine Ray Bolger as a heavy. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a pretty, you know, it wasn't a very heavy movie, but um, it was a fun, kind of a fun, diabolical villain who danced and all and, and that was a fun memory because we uh, we all got to go to the rap party, uh, which was held out at Walt Disney's ranch. Oh, this wonderful! Was one of, yeah, when we were about ten years old, so I have some nice pictures of him in that uh, in his Barnaby costume dancing, and that was a fun memory. What were his 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 memories of of um, of uh, the other characters, uh, you know, Jack Haley and uh, oh, well, Bert Lahr, the Cowardly all, Lion. All good. All so good. And uh, Jack Haley was a neighbor, actually, in Beverly Hills. And they were friends and went to the same church and were very close. And um, they all got along brilliantly. They were all, you know, Jack Haley and Bert Lahr right. and Uncle Ray were all vaudevillians. Mm-hmm. And so they had a lot in common and uh, great camaraderie. They loved Judy Garland, of course. Right, right. Um, was did well, he suspect then that that she was being maybe mishandled or taken advantage of uh, at that point, or had that really started? Gosh, you know what? He he never alluded to that. Um, in my personal experience with him, I've never I never heard him. Speak to that I know he was super fond of her and very devastated when she died and you know knew that she had problems you know the extent to which they knew about those things I don't know I don't know be, yeah I'd be interested to know whether she ever turned to him you know later in life when when things got difficult for Christi- yeah. Christiana will take a time yeah. out we'll come back Chris Rickard is here the niece of the great Ray Bolger the scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz right here on The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. Question everything. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett. Welcome back. Coming up in Hour 2, Dr. Lynn Katai from the uh, Phoenix Lights. It's been over 21 years, and 
Uh, Dr. Lin will be speaking at the um, MUFON Symposium 2018 down in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, sort of in the greater Philadelphia area. And uh, she'll be along. She'll be one of the featured speakers. Incidentally, the timing of that is quite interesting. Uh, July the 27th, I believe it kicks off, the 27th, 28th, and 29th. Last week we had uh, Dr. John Brandenburg on the uh, program talking about... It was last week, wasn't it, uh, Albert? Yes. We were talking about uh, Mars. And uh, so July 27th is that particular date, is the uh, the date of the uh, the lunar eclipse. It'll be a blood moon. And also, Mars will be the closest it's been to uh, Earth in 15 years. Very propitious. Now, as I went out to the uh, parking lot to let um, Albert and Ryan into the uh, the building, and uh, beautiful, um, uh, the moon, kind of a crescent moon with Venus right there, very visible. So lots going on in the night skies. All right, we are delighted to have uh, Christiana Rickert, Chris Rickert, with us, the niece of uh, Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow. Hard to believe it's been nearly 80 years since The Wizard of Oz uh, came out back in 1939. And uh, we were talking about some of the other cast members and, and how your uncle got along with with them. Um, is there now? We should point out that uh, OzCon 2018. This is a um, a conference celebrating the Wizard of Oz is uh, going to be taking place August the 10th to the 12th in California. Where specifically will that be, uh, Chris? Oh, it's um, it's at a, it's held in it's going to be in Pomona, California this year. It's held at a place called the Kellogg Conference Center, and I'm really looking forward to it. This year, it's um, focused on the Tin Man, and uh, so I was kind of surprised to get an invitation from them. I'm really uh, looking forward to it, and I've made friends uh, with um, Jack Haley's grandson, Mm. and he is such a nice guy, and we have such a nice time, you know, communicating on Facebook and stuff, so I'm really looking forward to spending a little time with him because his grandfather and my Uncle Ray, as I said, were just neighbors on the same street in Beverly Hills, went to the same church, and he met my Uncle Ray when he was younger. So, um, anyway, I I enjoyed your mention of the crescent moon with the star because I happened, right before the show, I looked up and saw that. That's always been my favorite um, sky, is the crescent moon with that star, and I wondered what it symbolized. Hmm. You know, and I don't know if you know or not, but it's interesting that you mention it because it's a... Uh, I don't, but uh, that's, big, that's Venus, you know, I guess we're looking at. Yeah, Venus, yeah, Venus. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's bright and it is beautiful. Um, mm, it's, yeah. You, your uncle helped you. you. You received a devastating diagnosis. Was it thyroid cancer? Yes, it was, yeah. How long ago was it that? Was, that was, uh, oh gosh, it's been about... Um, Oh, it's about 16 years ago now. It's been quite a long time ago, and uh, so this is after he died. But so his, but his. It was after he died. Right. Yeah, it was after he died. And um, what happened was, uh, you know, first of all, there are several different kinds of thyroid cancer. And, uh, the one I got is the middle kind, so it's not fatal, but it's not the very benign kind either. So it was enough to be quite scary, and. Uh, I, uh, my Uncle Ray was gone at the time. He passed away also of cancer, but, uh, you know, it was just a remarkable journey, and I, and I, uh, it took me so deeply into my roots, my childhood, all my memories of my Uncle Ray and my aunt and my family, because, you know, my mom was on Broadway with Uncle Ray, my dad was a writer, and they were just a very close-knit family, so I kind of reviewed my whole life, and, um, uh, just wanted to write down for people some of these ideas that helped me so much uh, getting through that cancer. Really uh, valuable ideas uh, that tied in with my Uncle Ray's life and the story of The Wizard of Oz and the movie, just experiences I had with my aunt and uncle in life, and uh, mainly to give people a, you know, a, some way to navigate their own journey. And at the same time, get to know these messages that my Uncle Ray gave me that made a big impression on me. Well, what, give me and, an example of a message that he gave you that you that you used during your, your battle with cancer. Okay, well, the whole, the whole book is 
the whole book, this little memoir of mine, is is totally dedicated to that. So, um, you know, some some of the messages. You know, one message is always be yourself. Uh, don't try to be anything that you're not. And so, in the book, then I would you know tell why he emphasized that, how that shows up in the you know in the Wizard of Oz story, and then how it showed up in his life. You know why he why he thought that was important, right? And uh, that's one. And then the other one is uh, you know another chapter is on the yellow brick road, having to do with where do you stand in life? You know where are what's your grounding? What are you grounded in? And um, what he thought about that topic, and then how how that topic is exemplified in the in the movie or the book. You know, right? So it's like a I braided three three life stories, kind of his life, what we see in the picture, in the movie, and then, you know, what he told me about it and my personal experience and how these things all came together. Right. So, you know, I, I wrote the book in such a way that by the end of the book, I feel, you know, my goal was to give people some of this juice that my Uncle Ray had. You know, he was kind of... Um, bigger than life in, in some ways. He was a very kind of electrifying person and um, kind of a, uh, he was a spiritual person. He had enormous amounts of energy and talent, and you know, he was quite a strong um, influence in our lives, for sure. How did he learn to dance? How did he learn to dance? Well, he started out, I mean, his, you know, his legendary story is he went to a waltz with a, at high school, and he was a, a terrible wallflower, and he couldn't dance, and he made a fool of himself. So he decided he had to go out and get some basic, you know, basic steps. And what happened was, he was taking a, uh, he, he was hanging outside of a dance school and learning some steps and all. And and a and a famous Russian ballet master actually saw him and was interested in training him. Now, at this time, my Uncle Ray was almost a, uh, like a street boy. He grew up in uh, Dorchester, Massachusetts. His mother passed away when I think he was 14 or 15, and his dad kind of took off. And so Uncle Ray's uh, sister went to live with another part of the family, and then he was on his own completely. So he started his life uh, very young and got got interested in dancing just for that reason, because he was bad at it. And and he had an amazing body. that He was born with this. I mean, oh, his balance, his balance. Yeah, and, his balance was incredible. Yeah. And these this, these legs, you know, the, just the way he was put together, his body, long, long legs and so limber. And um, it really just, it just came naturally to him. And so he studied a lot, and, uh, you know, then he started in vaudeville. And it all just kind of evolved, um, you know, bit by bit. Then he came to, um, he was with Gus Edwards, you know, he was with a vaudeville show. It came to Los Angeles, and that's where he met uh, my aunt. Now, she was um, selling her musical Song. She was only 16 at the time, and they they had they fell in love. It was love at first sight, and uh, they were just teenagers. But they started and they made a um, they worked together for the you know for the rest of time. She just managed his career, you know, um, read all the scripts, handled all the finances. So another part of the book that I wrote was to show what a man and a woman, or the male and the female together, uh, what, a, what a dynamic team they made, what, how their talents uh, you know, were so synergistic. They made a wonderful success of their lives and his career, and you know, it was just remarkable how they worked together. It was just remarkable. She was very creative and talented also. So um, They didn't die too far apart. Um, did they? Ten years, actually. Oh, it was ten years. I thought. I'm yes. sorry. I thought they both died the same year. I I, I misread the bio- well, biography. Then, all right. Well, that's okay. You know what? Because it was. I think it was 87, 
and then she passed away in 1997. Oh, no, 97. but she's had 10 years oh, beyond that, okay. which was just, it was just remarkable. And, uh, so, you know, I, I tell about their relationship and how they met and just how these things unfolded. And, um, you know, to kind of give people a feeling of sometimes how destiny works and, you know, uh, listening to your heart and all of these themes. But, um, Back to the OzCon, I, I was just going to say there's a, you know, the lots of interesting people coming and, uh, I had never known that there were all of these Oz groups across the country, you know, who were very, very interested in Oz. I, I didn't know anything about that until, until I wrote my little book and someone invited me to come to one. Right. So, um, there'll be all these people there who are very enthusiastic about Oz and it's, it's really kind of nice to see, um, I mean, the movie just does not, it, it, it's got something so um, deeply um, allegorical or something, sure. you know, about well, I mean, human, human life. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it is one of the, old. it's one of the oldest stories, really, and it's a, it's a hero's journey, basically, right? It's a, it's a hero's journey, that's exactly right. That's exactly right, and I, and I think, um, I mean, there's just something so magical about the way, the way the story fell together in terms of, all these characters who um, are missing pieces of themselves, and it takes all of them working together, you know, to get the outcome that they want. Right. And uh, I, 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 you know, I, I make a lot of pitches in the little book um, for, um, you know, the world that we live in today. You know, the, the necessity of us people working together, and um, you know. People not having to be perfect, not having to be famous, not having to be all of that, but but having to rely on one another, you know, and um, why that works out better when people cooperate, and those are kind of my right. opinions, you well, know. <laughs> what do you, in terms of the archetypes, I mean, obviously Dorothy's the protagonist, and the Wicked Witch is the, or Miss, uh, is it Gulch? Yeah, Miss Gulch. Yeah, right. Miss Gulch, she's the nemesis. I suppose Glinda would be, you know, the, the the good witch. She's the mentor. But what archetypes do the the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, your uncle, and uh, the Cowardly Lion? What roles do they fill? What's the archetype? Well, first of all, you know, my opinion is, you know, with any like a great work of literature or anything, it's uh, very subjective. So people can see whatever they want to see. But I think in the most obvious fashion. You know, the archetype for me of the scarecrow is, um, well, he represents, you know, a fellow who doesn't have a brain. And so he's kind of, you know, he's a symbol of a, of a, he's a straw man. And, uh, you know, what hap, you know, what happens when you're lacking a, if you're lacking a brain or you're lacking a heart or you're lacking the courage? I mean, these are, you know, just human traits. Um, you know that it's in one way or another we're always deficient in some area. Right, right. And so you know, un- unless you in- unless you embrace that uh, and join with other people and say, okay, you know, this is my deficiency or this is my weak point. I need some help over here from you. So I, I kind of look at the whole thing as just sort of one human consciousness uh, that's divided into these characters. You know. Uh, these symbolic characters, right? And um, right, and you know, the, 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 so you can really relate to to every character in the story. Sure, sure. It, you they, know, every single one of them. But in my case, I got fascinated uh, with the scarecrow image. I uh, kind of always was my whole life because um, kind of kind of interesting. But you know, when your family member and you're little is the scarecrow. Um, you know, it's like there was no separation. He was our uncle. We were very close to him. And then he was also on TV as in this scarecrow costume. You know, it's kind of like they're blended. They're sort of blended. But, um, yeah, you know. I remember as a child watching The Wizard of Oz and my, uh, my sister and I would, we would run out of the room. Uh, when the um, when the Wicked Witch came on, but I was oh, I'm t- to this day the Flying Monkeys 
just they frighten the the heck out of me. <laughs> Were you affected by the movie that way? Were you frightened by? Yes, frightened by the monkeys. Too too terrifying. Had to leave the room definitely. You know what? Just today, um, you know, I never knew. I should have, but I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm not a Wizard of Oz authority by any means, and there are many who are, but. There are, uh, but the monkeys were, um, some of them were rubber and some of them were, you know, people in costumes. And uh, I didn't even know that. But boy, were they frightening. Yes, you know, to they this were, day. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, they were, they were, that show was terrifying, you know, for people. And, and I think that's part of the, uh, you know, that's part of the magic of it. You know, that we all endured that frightening experience together as children. Right. You right. know, watching, watching all of that. And, uh, did you ever you know, meet, was, did you meet Margaret Hamilton who played the Wicked Witch? No, I never, I never met her. Uh, but, you know, Uncle Ray did talk about her and, uh, they loved her and she was a, just a sweetheart. She was a, she was a school teacher prior to this and, um, I just was reading something he said about her. Oh, no, no, I was listening to something about her. Um, he was so impressed with her intellect, and she was very involved with ecology and nature and all sorts of things I like remember that. As a, I remember as a kid, her, she was in those, was it Maxwell House, the coffee commercials? Yes, that's right. And that, for me, that, yes. that humanized her, and so I wasn't as afraid anymore of the Wicked Witch when I saw her on the, yeah. on the Wizard of Oz. Oh, we'll take a time out, Chris. Stay with us. We'll come back. Okay, the Conspiracy sure. Show, the niece of Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow, is with us on the Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. The truth will set you free, but first, it will really tick you off. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett. Welcome back. The website is strangeplanet.ca, and there you can find the radio page for The Conspiracy Show, the uh, the links to the podcasts, and all my other projects are right there. There's a live events page. I, I was mentioning before that uh, this Saturday I was up at a Culticon up in Holstein, Ontario. Beautiful. It's up on the escarpment north of Brampton on Highway 10. And uh, uh, it's funny because I was taking part in a paranormal roundtable. And uh, the, um, the I was the only, I was kind of an outsider. Everyone else at the table, they were Wiccans. And uh, it was it was pretty hot and steamy on that uh, on on Saturday up there, and so I was uh, sitting beside um, a, f- a gentleman by the name of who goes by the the handle Freighter Arceus, and um, I said, "Are he says I don't know about you." I said, "But I'm melting. Are you?" And he said, "No, I'm not that kind of witch," <laughs> which kind of harkens <laughs> back to the Margaret Hamilton character, of course, uh-huh. the Wicked Witch. Uh-huh. Um, Chris Rickard is uh, with us. Um, what we were, before the break, we were talking about uh, Margaret Hamilton. You hadn't met her, but your your uh, your uncle Ray ha- thought very highly of her. Um, oh yeah, yeah. They did a play together on Broadway. I think it was called Come Summer. Um, yeah, they were good friends, very good friends. And how much time did you spend with your with your uncle growing up? Were they were they were they close to you? I mean, it, I mean, geographically, were you close to their place? Yeah, they were. Uh, well, you know, our family was a little unusual. In uh, we spent a lot of time with them, but um, the main reason was my aunt uh, married Uncle Ray, and as, but as I said, he was almost like an orphan. He really didn't have much family. My aunt had three brothers, and they all stayed together. So it was as if Uncle Ray joined the family with all these. They all became brothers. So my Aunt Gwen took quite a lot of pride in bringing him into this family. So they all remained in Los Angeles, and so we all, you know, that's where we grew up. They lived in Beverly Hills. We lived over the hill in Burbank. So, you know, we went when I was little. We'd go over almost every Sunday, and... um but yeah, my aunt, my aunt, and my uncle, you know, um, spent a lot of time in New York, uh, back and forth. They lived in both places, L.A. and New York. And um, you know, at different times, my dad would be in New York with them. He was a television producer early on, and they all, but they all stuck together and helped each other. My aunt and her three brothers and Uncle Ray, they were uh, very, very close. So we saw them almost on all holidays, of course. And then any time we just wanted to go over and visit. And um, 
so yeah, they were, you know, they're very, it was a very close group. Very interesting group of people. And did you meet, uh, did you meet Bert Lahr, the, the Cowardly Lion? No, I never did. In fact, I, I never did meet any of the characters from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and obviously, I mean, it's been, it's been nearly 80 years. Is there what, anyone who is connected with that production that's still alive? I know we just lost the, the last of the Munchkins, Jerry Marin, back the in May. The last of the Munchkins is anyone, yeah, from the show itself. I don't know to tell you. I'm, uh, I don't, not that I'm aware of, uh, you know, in terms of a, of a tech person or something like that, right. but, um, They'd have Certainly to have been very. The, they would have had to have been very, very young, and now they would obviously be yeah, very, very old. Very, 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 very young. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think so. But um, you know, I wanted to say something because I, I know you have a conspiracy show, and I was kind of thinking, well, I don't have anything very conspiratorial to say. But one of the things I find interesting is uh, I, you know, on YouTube and things. Yes. There, you do see a lot of, uh, well, strange things about the Wizard of Oz. Yes. You know, of course, there's always this little cult that there were odd things and, and people dying and all of that. I don't think any of that is true. But the other thing that I see most recently is, um, you know, uh, concerns about all of the occultic Right. meanings of the movie right. or the, you know the story whatever right it was supposedly and, uh, used as in in um in project monarch which was part of mk ultra yes I, right the, yes. the, the movie yes. was no, made I, i'm and, aware of all of that yeah. i certainly am I, I i look at it i'm interested but i will tell you this i don't put uh i i, I don't put much stock in it in terms of the original you know l frank Baum stories uh now his his uh, his fan, you know he was into theosophy and that yes. was kind of a spiritualist movement at the time, and uh, but but I still you know I still think the important thing is you know I, I don't like to see the movie turned into something kind of you know nefarious dark or dark or right. totally mysterious and right. we we never had any inkling of that at all you know we, my uncle Ray talked about you know. Um, it, you know, basically, it was a great experience. There's now lots and lots of difficulties and, um, you know, uh, challenges with the production and all the different directors and, you know, the costuming and the heat and all of that. But, but, but he was so proud of the production. You know, it's like so many innovations taking place in the movie and the fantastic score and the music and all that. I mean, it's all so positive in my mind that so I just sort of don't, you know, I hope it stays more positive and, you know, with so many spin-offs and things now and they get a little stranger as the years go by. Right. What do you make but, of uh, Wicked, which is actually playing here in Toronto and it's been it's it's been around for many, many years. I remember Earth, I know. Eartha Kitt, and, and, yeah, of course, played just, uh, the witch. Hor- I've never seen it, and I and I think that's just terrible. At first, I didn't want to see it. That's many years ago. Now I think I really should go and see it. You know, um, I love The Wiz, and that was great. Uncle Ray loved The Wiz as oh, well. Mm-hmm. Thought it was great. Not the movie, but the, this Broadway play. Sure. You know, and I haven't seen Wicked. I know it sounds strange, but I I, I haven't seen it. What would your um, What would your uncle make of of Hollywood today? Golly. Oh man. Well, I think I think um probably he'd be pretty pretty appalled, but but I can't say for sure. You know, he was he was such an artist and he liked being um contemporary and up to date on things. You know, he wasn't like an old timer, he never had that kind of feel to him. He was always trying to stay current with things. So, you know, I don't know how how he would be, except I know, you know, as a dancer, he was so disciplined a person and um, so professional in, in in his approach to things. And, um, you know, that that made a big impression on me as a kid also, you know, just, just the way he lived and all of that and very disciplined. Uh, all right, Chris, we're going to so, take a quick so, yeah. time out. We'll come back and uh, continue to yeah. talk about the Scarecrow, Ray Bolger. Okay. With Chris Rickard. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us.
When in doubt, blame the government. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. A bit of a departure for us on The uh, the Conspiracy Show. We're talking with uh, Chris Rickert, who is the niece of the late, great Ray Bolger, of course, who played the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. And uh, her book, A Legend in Straw, The Spirit of My Uncle Ray Bolger, available at Amazon. And she'll be attending OzCon 2018 uh, from August 10th to the 12th in Pomona, California. And uh, you can register at OzConInternational.com. OzConInternational.com. Again, August 10th to the 12th in at the uh, Kellogg West Conference Center in Pomona, California. You were mentioning, you know, there was some innovative stuff that was happening on the uh, on that uh, on the set of The Wizard of Oz, and uh, of course, I, I remember that scene that was also very frightening when your uncle Ray uh, was set on fire. Of course, the scarecrow was set on oh, fire. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but and then there was a couple of scenes where the the, the witch uh, Margaret Hamilton was uh, you know burned, and she actually suffered some injuries. I think wasn't she burned twice? Couldn't say. I really don't know for sure about that. Oh, was um, was your uncle ever injured or during the during filming in any way? Well, he I, I know he fainted a few times on from the heat from the lights. Um, he wasn't permanently injured. I know that you know he had some damage to his face, but I think it was temporary from the um, you know the the makeup the makeup yeah from the makeup on his face and. Um, yeah, that was. I think the makeup was a big ordeal for everybody. So it was about two hours to put it on every day in the morning, you know. Right. And I, it, it left some lines and things, but not not permanent. There was also talk so, about the, uh, the, the the fake snow that was used was asbestos fibers. Um, mm. Was there any thought that the, I don't know how did your your uncle died of cancer? But was there any concern that exposure to asbestos on the set may have made him ill? Never heard about that. It certainly is a possibility, although it was many, many, many years later. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. But, uh, I don't know, cancer so rampant now. Yes. You know, and, uh, my aunt also had cancer, you know, had, had a double mastectomy and went right on with her life and, um, you know, so. Did did your uncle uh, get to keep the costume or anything from the Wizard of Oz? Were there any keepsakes that were left to the family? Uh, yeah, I have some nice things. Um, of course, the costume went to the Smithsonian. Um, we uh, and, and let's see, I'm trying to think. A lot of things went to the UCLA archives, and I want to get a little plug in because. Um, uh, a wonderful young woman named Holly Van Leuven has written a, a real biography of my Uncle Ray's entire career. So she went to those archives and did a lot of work. So that's coming out in February, and I can't wait to read it. You know, lots of details of things that I don't know about. Um, and that's going to be called Ray Bolger More Than a Scarecrow. But, you know, I have... Uh, not see I'm not all of, like I say I, I'm really not all about the the Wizard of Oz. My uncle Ray was you know a really good friend and and a family member. So you know I have his tap shoes. I have um, two um, of the original music sheets from the movie. So I have that. If I only had a brain and over the rainbow, I have the you know I have the lead sheets from that. And um, you know all the things that I have from him are are valuable to me. You yes. know. Yes. And. Uh, so, um, and the ruby slippers, uh, uh, the ruby shoes are, I believe, someone uh, uh, mentioned to me the other day that they're at the Smithsonian in Washington D.C. Yeah, they're at the Smithsonian also. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know the these collectors. I I just saw something. Uh, you, you know, I didn't know. We, hmm. Uh, these are uh, the 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 great Oz fans. A lot of what they do is collect all kinds of, you know, memorabilia and things. And some people have remarkable collections. Their whole homes are full of Wizard of Oz things. But I have to say, in my life with my Uncle Ray, you know, the Wizard of Oz was 
a fantastic role that he played, but he had so many other parts. And, uh, you know, he won a Tony Award on Broadway in Where's Charlie. That was the show that my mother was in with him. And, um, you know, in terms of our family and our life, it, it wasn't all about The Wizard of Oz. It was, my Uncle Ray was always very, very present and excited about whatever project he was doing at that moment or next, you know, and it was, um, it's, it's, um, certainly, the great legacy of, of his with the public will always be the scarecrow, but um, you know he had a he had a he had a long career doing all kinds of things. Sure, so, sure. In vaudeville, so, yeah, I mean, the vaudeville uh-huh. days. I mean, we have we still have old movie theaters up here in in Toronto that were part of the vaudeville circuit. Oh um, wow! Yeah, sure. Lots of theaters around. Uh, you know, they used to go by the name like the Hippodrome and things like that. And yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's right. Bing yeah. Crosby and Bob Hope played. Uh, yeah, played up here. I met a gentleman once who worked uh, at one of the theaters during the the vaudeville days. Uh, he later worked with the uh, the Capitol Theater when it turned in, was turned into a movie house uh, uh-huh. up into his eighties. But he he told me the story of of uh, when Bob Hope and Bing Crosby came to Toronto. He had to go out and and uh, pr- get Bob, uh, Bing Crosby's pants pressed. That was his claim to fame. But did did uh, mm-hmm. did your uncle Ray ever tour vaudeville up in Canada? I, I don't know. I, it, you know, I, I, it doesn't ring a, it doesn't ring a bell with me. But it certainly is possible. And uh, you know, I think the woman who's written the biography. That's the kind of thing I'm hoping to find out. You know more about. Of course, he was all over all over New England and. Um, you know, and then out to California, and you know. Did he ever cross paths with with other vaudevillians, like the, the the Marx Brothers, for example? I wouldn't be surprised. You know, there's there's no end of people that they were involved with. I he was. I, I find things all the time. You know, when they when he passed away, when my aunt passed away, I mean, we we just went through the house and could take anything we wanted. So I wound up with. Mainly, I was interested in old correspondence and things of that nature, and he was friends with so many, so many interesting people. I mean, people don't realize what a what a heyday it was. It, 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 he was friends with Alfred Hitchcock, and um, oh, just so many people. You know, Sammy Davis Jr. and all these, a lot of the greats from that period. And uh, one of the things that um, Jack Haley's grandson and I have been talking about is, you know, this is a bygone era. I mean, these were kind of a different caliber of people, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. Yes, with because these amazing they... histories and all the all the things they've seen and all the things they, the people they knew and the experiences they had and uh, because they were they were the whole package. They danced, they sang, yeah. they they could act. You mentioned Sammy it, Davis Jr. I mean, he, he did yeah. impressions. He, yeah, amazing. Yeah. And we'll never see those types of, of performers again because they came up, you know, uh, through vaudeville, into radio, then into film, and then finally into television. So uh, exactly. they, they did it all. They, I, I always remember watching the old uh, Tonight Show, and you know, you would have on the on the on the couch there would be you know Johnny Carson sitting next to him. Might, might be your uncle Ray Bolger next to him, Joan Crawford, Jack Benny. Yeah, I know Jack Benny. And now I watch these these talk shows. I have no idea who any of these people are. Anybody is don't know who any of them are. Isn't that so true? Right. I mean, that's of course that's my you know that that's my experience too. So yeah, it was almost like you know they used to talk about the star system. It right. was such a different time, you know, yes. back then in the old days and the uh, oh. Very different. So, uh, did your uncle teach you to dance? No, he did not teach me to dance. Now he was he was a lot of fun. If I took friends over there, or if he came over on a holiday and I had friends and stuff, he would, um, you know, that he would dance with them. And he he was always um, very uh, mm, outgoing. You know, he he just on the Fourth of July he would go up and down the block to visit all the people that were <laughs> out to see the fireworks. You know, he 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 really loved to entertain and um, meet people and greet people all the time. 
So he did not teach me how to dance. Um, I was always interested in writing, and he really encouraged me a lot in that. And, um, yeah, they were, you know, they were very well-rounded, my aunt and uncle. They were interested, very involved in politics and, you know, so... It was an, you know, it was a very interesting, <laughs> it was a very interesting childhood. Right, right. Plus, plus the magical aspects of just, you know, having, um, having your uncle be the scarecrow, and uh, you know, it, it was a definitely a unique uh, experience. You were with you. You helped n- nurse him during his his final days. I understand. Yes, yes. Both both my aunt Gwen and my uncle Ray. I used to. Well, I mean, the truth is I did the grocery shopping and things like that for the last number of years, and, and that was the time I got to spend with my Uncle Ray. Um, I usually went over on a Wednesday and had lunch with them, and then I'd go out and do whatever, the sh- grocery shopping, whatever was on the list, and um, that was kind of a special time that I kind of had them to, all to myself. You know, we'd sit around and talk and visit about all kinds of things, and, and then... Uh, yeah, then my uncle Ray got sick, and uh, that, you know that's in the book as well. And my aunt went took care of him at home. His wife, I mean, they were so they were so devoted. You know, they had so many years together. Right. And then he did wind up going to a, a small Catholic nursing home at the end of his life. And um, so, yeah, and then my aunt, as you say, lived another ten years. Most in the same house, you know, stayed in the same house and right. all, and it was, uh, most, most she val- was an amazing person. Most valuable lesson you learned from your, your, your uncle? The most valuable person that I learned from my uncle was that he always talked about love and, you know, always told us that, you know, love, love is the most important thing. That's and it. Uh, every day that goes by in my life, I get closer and closer to, you know, realizing that celebrity doesn't do it, money doesn't do it, politics doesn't have the answer. You know, it always, in the end, it always comes back to love. And, and you know, the other thing was, he always used to say, you have to have a philosophy of life. You have to have a philosophy of life. So, you know, in other words, you don't just, live and go along with everything you've got to have some uh, some ideas in your head of your own that's right an unexamined purpose. life is not worth living all yeah. right uh, christiana wonderful to meet you thank you so much for this thank you richard i so appreciate it thank uh, you so much a legend in straw the spirit of my uncle ray bolger available at amazon when we come back dr lynn katai the phoenix lights 21 years later what have we learned dorothy back with more in a moment What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do?